Okay, I want to start with a question tonight. And, and it's, I just, I mean, feel free to raise your hand if you want to or whatever. Um, but is there anyone here tonight who has always gotten your prayer answered from the Lord? Just, if there is, just would you raise your hand? Anybody going once? Okay, all right, so, so, so I would just tell you that I pray, it seems, it seems like a lot of prayers, and they don't get answered. And, and maybe it's just because I'm not as righteous as you, right? But um, I've been praying all week. Uh, many of you have been praying this week about our nation, uh, what, what Eileen and I started the worship service with here tonight. I would say to you this, it's been a tough week. It's been a tough week. Um, just before I left to come here today, this morning, late this morning, um, the election was called for Joe Biden, um, and there's this turmoil brewing now within our nation. And everybody's wondering, I'm wondering, well, what does this mean for our future? What does this mean for our standing on the global stage? And all of this stuff. A and, and I have to keep this in perspective. Um, you guys know Pastor John MacArthur. Anybody just raise your hand if you know of the name? Okay, Pastor John MacArthur. How about Pastor Andy Stanley? You know Pastor Andy Stanley? Okay, all right. How about Pastor Tim Chalice? Do you know Pastor Tim Chalice? No, you don't know him? Okay, I didn't think you would. Um, he is... One of the most prevailing voices of the, of the kingdom of God in Canada. That's probably why you don't know him. And last night, I saw a message from him that said, had a picture of, his, of, his, of a young man there. Uh, his name is Nick. And he says, oh, how I miss you, my godly son, my not here son, my gone too soon son. Oh, what, the, what, the, what, what is that? Well, Wednesday, he's home from seminary, this 20-year-old son. Father's a pastor. He's training to be a pastor. He has a fiance and a younger sister. And his fiance himself and his younger sister are playing a game in the front yard. He collapses, loses consciousness, and cannot be resuscitated. The funeral was at the seminary yesterday. So it's been a tough week. And then I get a phone call from Iggy sharing the news that he shared with us about the, the group down at Tampa 2. And that's terrible. And, and, and so when we face these kinds of moments, overdoses, uh, death, uh, turbulence, absence of peace, this constant bickering, whatever it may be, um, it gives ammunition to those around us who despise our God. There's a group, that, not just atheists, but they call themselves the new atheists. I, I, I assure you they're just like the old atheists, okay? <laughs> Trust me on that, okay? But this is their little calling card. This is, what, this is their little mantra. This is what they say. This is their accusation that they lay, they lay before the feet of our God. Is that your God does not listen. Your God does not care because your God does not exist. He is hiding. If it, see, it's so funny. If your God existed... Why does it seem like he's hiding from us? And I'm like, oh, brother, listen to it. Not brother, this dude, moron, whatever, I don't fill in the blank. Read the first page of the book. It wasn't God who went and hid from us. It was quite literally us who went and hid from God, okay? And so there is just this, oh my gosh, seemingly unbridled sin that is just cooking its way through our land, through our world. And so it gives ammunition, it gives um, all this seemingly authority to our enemies to say their God does not exist. I, I don't know, maybe you've been there. Um, it, was, it was several years ago, I'd come in from a, a preaching event uh, engagement up in the, the frozen northeast and, and, um, and, and I'd come back from two or three days, four days gone and, and got just out of school the next morning and Jennifer and I went on a hot date to breakfast that morning. And I don't even know if you remember this, but we were talking and and I asked Jennifer, like, hey, so tell her about the, how the weekend went and everything. It was great and all this stuff. But we are talking about all the, the bad things. Like, what is there out there in our life? What is it that we've faced, you faced, I've faced, she's faced, that just lends itself to going, man, where is God when life hurts? And so she just kind of rattled off a list of, of things like she didn't understand. Like, why didn't God do this? We prayed about this. Why didn't God move? Why didn't God act? Why didn't God, you know, do this or do that? And then she says, well, that's my list. What about you? And I'm like, oh, I'm not playing the game. <laughs> okay. That's a that's a one-way street because my answers I thought my answers are just far too raw and so she said she pushed and I said okay fine and so I began to rattle down a list of things and failures or just points in my life that I went Lord what what are you doing are you do are you doing anything 
What is going on? I don't understand this. I'm hurting. We're crying out, and nothing seems to be changing. In those moments, what do you do? And in those moments, what do you believe about God? He's not different. He's not going to change. But what you think about him, what you believe about him, how you carry yourself, what you say in those moments, you can either make things better or you can make things far worse. I'm going to read you a story, well, part of a story tonight, where some people said some things that made it worse. They didn't understand what God was up to. They didn't like what they were experiencing. And so they let Jesus know that. This is a long story, so I'm not going to try to preach it in one night. In fact, I'm not even going to try to preach it in two weekends. It's going to take us three weekends to do it justice. And then even then, we're going to be leaving a lot on the table. I'm going to be reading to you from John chapter 11. It's a famous story. If you have your Bible, turn to John 11. Um, But if you don't, it will be on the screen. This is a long, long story. We're going to break it down. Here it goes. Um, Something bad has happened. Um, Jesus is out of the, he's kind of across the Dead Sea, he's across the Jordan River, and then this happens in John 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was ill, he was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, that's a town just outside of Jerusalem, uh, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So just again, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, they're all brothers and sisters, okay? So it was Mary um, whom the Lord had anointed and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. So Jesus knows this family. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness will not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You, you need to, if you got your Bible, you need to underline that line right there, okay? That's underlined in my Bible. I just say, you probably should be underlining your Bible. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Because, you're, because what that says, you're going you're gonna to call that into question. You're going to doubt what I just read to you from God's word. But I'm telling you, he loved Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he, Jesus, stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, He said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. That's where Lazarus is. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews there were just seeking to stone you. That's to kill you, to throw rocks at your head until you die. Are you going to go back there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I will go to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of Lazarus' death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And so Thomas called the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Okay, um, I saw we're going to read for tonight. The story goes on. There's a whole lot more story to get to. But right now, just so we're all on the same page, we got ourselves an official mess, don't we? We got ourselves a mess. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus. Jesus, the one that you love, He's sick, you, you, better come, you better come and help him. And, and that makes sense that Mary and Martha would do that because if you just look, this is the 11th chapter. We're about halfway through the Gospel of John. I mean, Jesus has you know, already healed leprosy. He's already um, uh, walked, he's calmed a storm. He's already uh, healed a man who was paralyzed. He's done all these miracles. And so surely whatever like diverticulitis or tuberculosis or diabetes or you know, you know, high blood pressure, whatever it is that Lazarus has, Jesus can like handle this. Right? I mean, Jesus has got this. And in fact, what we've even seen is that Jesus, just in the Gospel of John, the first 10 chapters, we've seen that Jesus has no problem healing somebody that he's not even in the same room with, not even the same part of the country with. Okay? And so they rightly reach out to Jesus and say, hey, we've got ourselves a mess. You, you've got to like, come help Lazarus. And so Jesus, out of his great love for Lazarus, does what? He waits two whole days.
what? You read this and you go, that's not, that's not, who, I want. That's not who I want Jesus to be. It's not what I want Jesus. I want Jesus to hop on the red eye and land in, Tampa, uh, in, in Jerusalem International Airport. I want him to like go camel jack somebody and woo across the desert, okay? Like I want Jesus to get back there and do that thing for Lazarus that only Jesus can do. And instead, Jesus does whatever Jesus does. We're not told. That's a good question when we get to heaven, Ian. Okay, let's just put that one down. All right, well, just what we, two days, two days, Jesus just does what Jesus is doing on the other side of the Jordan River. Then it gets really twisted. Lazarus dies. Homeboy goes from being sick to dead. Now see what we have here. We have a body count. Not all the characters are in this story anymore. We lost one. Lazarus has died. And it's like, I don't think it had to go down that way. So just put yourself, just for a moment, in the sandals of Mary and Martha, Lazarus' two sisters. Just, just be honest. You hear those new atheists start clopping along the streets, don't you? Mm-hmm. Your God's real quiet. Your God's hiding. Your God don't know how to handle this one. He didn't have this one figured out, so he's just going to let it pass by. Okay, that's one thought. I don't think it's the actual truth, though. Um, what I think is this. I'm going to share two things with you tonight that I hope will encourage you. And, and the first one is this, is that God's silence is not indifference. Just because God's not saying anything does not mean that God does not care about you. Does not mean that God is not aware of what's going on in your life. Does not mean that he does not love you. In fact, in fact, what we know here is what didn't happen is that Jesus didn't double book himself. It wasn't like Jesus says, oh, I'm gonna be in, I gotta go help Lazarus. Oh, but wait, I told Hank over here that I'd help him with his donkey. No, that's not what happened. It's not like Jesus says, we're gonna bump Lazarus down on the priority list. It's not like Jesus is mad at Lazarus because he didn't tithe enough or volunteer in kids' church. We know a lot of things that didn't happen. What we don't know is why Jesus didn't come immediately, Okay. But what we do know is this, is that God's silence in this story and in your stories does not mean that he is indifferent towards us. In fact, I can prove that to you. Not once, but twice, just in these 16 verses that I read to you, Jesus says that he loves Lazarus. Okay? In fact, it's not even going to be the last time in this story that even some of Jesus' enemies say, man, this dude loved that guy. Golly. So just a... Not once, but twice we're told in the story, just these 16 verses, that Jesus loves Lazarus. And then also, John tells us that Jesus and Lazarus are friends. So something's going on. And like, what do we have to like figure out here? Let me pause for a second. So my office is right over here on the other side of this wall. And in, in, in the church that I've served across 24 years, people will come in and see me on a Tuesday afternoon. They're like, hey, Pastor Dave, can we pray or can we have... Um, a conversation about our marriage or a conversation about our children or a conversation about my faith or whatever's going on my job, wh whatever it may be. And a lot of times it's like, I, I got a problem. I got a, I got a problem. I don't know how to figure it out. I don't know what's going on. I just want God to show up and fix it. Okay. And, and a lot of times it's, it's a not so good situation. There, there's something bad going on. And this is a question that I usually ask up front. I'll say right now, Pauline, let's just use Pauline. First. Pauline, right now, right where you sit, what do you think God thinks of you? Right now, as you sit here in my office, we're talking, maybe she's crying, I don't know. What does God think about you right now? You know, when I ask that question to people, a lot of times they'll say, I don't know. Okay, well, that's a fair and honest answer. Sometimes they'll say, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe he's mad at me. Maybe, maybe he's angry. Maybe he doesn't love me. I, I, can't, I can't, like, subscribe to any of those answers. You know why? Because I learned this song a long time ago. I'm not going to sing it to you. <laughs> You're welcome. I learned this song a long time ago. Even when I learned it, I didn't fully understand it. But this is how it goes right here up on the screen. Look at this. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. 
yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, for the hard-headed people in the room, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So let me ask the question again. Right now where you're sitting tonight, listen to me ramble on about this 2,000-year-old story. What does God think about you? What does God think about you? Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to handle this story. You, you may be sitting here going, Pastor David, I've read this story before. I've been in Sunday school since 1917. Or what, okay, whatever, fine. I don't care. And you know, how, you know how it shakes out. You're like, but I've read ahead. Fine, great, awesome, good. You get two stars and a, and a cookie, okay? Great. You know how this story ends. I listed about three or four stories at the beginning of this sermon that nobody knows the ending to. You might know the ending of this story. Good. Good. You don't know the ending of your story. You don't know the next question mark you're going to walk through. You don't know the next trouble that you're going to walk through. You don't know the next 2.14 a.m. phone call you're going to get. And I'm simply just asking you in those moments when you're in Mary and Martha's shoes and you're going, our brother died, we don't think he had to. What are you up to, God, and what do you feel about me? Yes, Jesus loves me. I can't see it right now. Yes, Jesus loves me. I don't really, gosh, is there any proof of that? Yes, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so and God's word always tells us the truth. So guys, I want you to understand this. That God's silence in this story, in my story, in your story, in every story, does not mean he is indifferent towards us. Okay, that's the first thing. Before I get to the second thing, let me say this, a little exclaimer. That does not mean that God's going to coddle us. That does not mean that God's going to come running to us and wipe us off and dust away every little boo-boo, okay? Because that's not what Jesus' purpose is. It's not what his focus is was. So let me tell you exactly what Jesus' focus was. Jesus' focus in this story and in every story for the past umpteen gazillion billion eons has been this one singular thing, glorifying his Father. How did Eileen end her prayer uh, 20 minutes ago? The way we, she said, the way we always end our prayer, in asking God to glorify himself through his son, Jesus, in whatever way, uh, whatever problem or issue we're praying about. God, you're going to be the hero at the end of the story. You're going to be the savior. You're going to be the, the hero with the, the cape flapping in the wind. So Jesus is all about glorifying his father. How do I know that? Well, watch. It says it right there, the black ink on the white page, in verse 4. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. That is exactly what Jesus said. Now, see, here's the thing. You and I won't actually say these words. We won't actually like say, yeah, you know, Kelly, I see Jesus as my heavenly butler, or Ian, I just really call Jesus my, my genie in a bottle. Like, I just, I do my own thing. I roll through my life. I got my own thing. And then, but when it gets over my head, the water gets deeper. It's out of my, you know, above my pay grade. Then, then and only, I call in Jesus, and I have him come in and rescue me, and then I go back to doing my own thing again. We won't say that, but isn't that almost exactly what we do? Okay, maybe not you people, but for me, for me, right, this is what I do. Oh, God, I got this. God, I got this. Oh, wait, death. I, I got a little tickle in my throat. I got, I got, I got the little cough covered. Uh, what you going to do with death, though, David? That's beyond me. And I'm simply articulating to you tonight that in every situation, every story, here's what Jesus is going to be about. He's going to be about glorifying his Father. He wants to point everyone to his Father. This is why he says it in verse 4, the glory of God. Um, I'll tell you a story here. Some of you will know it. Um, I know we're missing a lot of folks tonight. And some of us used to go to another church uh, together years and years and years ago. And it was a pastor there by the name of Brian. And I remember the story that Brian said in a sermon. I, I um, Eileen and Skip, I don't even know if you were there yet if, when you heard this, when he, and he shared the story. And I called him to say, hey, man, can I tell this story? Sure, sure, sure. But, but Pastor Brian, a friend of ours, 
um, some of us know. He has four kids, two boys, two girls. Um, it's a lot of kids. And so they were uh, with her family, uh, Dustin's family, I think in, in the Orlando area, at a mall when, when their, their youngest was, or their youngest daughter was um, a very little, little tyke. And they were like in one of those little places where all, you know, the food court and the escalators and everything. And little Laney had run off uh, and kind of disappeared because I guess when you got four kids, you know, like you keep up with three out of four of them, that's pretty good odds, you know. But little Laney disappears and she, she grabs on to um, the little black rail that goes parallel to the escalator going up at the 45 degree angle. And she lets on, she, she just goes, and all of a sudden it goes up. And she kind of spazzes, she freaks, and she doesn't let go. She kind of tightens, and it just begins to lift her off the ground. Well, um, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> and what goes up must come down. And so as the escalator gets to the close, somebody in the crowd notices it, points and screams, but it's too late. The escalator's knocked around, her hands are released from it, and she falls more than 20 feet onto a tile floor. Little bitty girl. And so somebody calls 911. They race over to her, do what little medical help they can give. They're, she's thrown into the back of this ambulance that arrived pretty quickly. And they just made a beeline through the city to the hospital. And so Brian is telling a story. He goes, we just left the kids with some other folks, and Dustin and I hopped in our truck, and we just followed that ambulance as best we could. And all we could say was, God, you are good all the time. All the time, God, you are good. God, you are good all the time. All the time, God, you are good. And he said, I, I wanted to pray. I, I just... I wanted to say, God, save her. God, help her. God, make sure she's okay. Make sure she's safe. Make sure this is going to be okay. But it was just, God, you're good. You're good all the time. God, you're good. You're good all the time. God, you're good. You're good all the time. And, and in fact, those of you who were there, you remember that was what we printed on our T-shirts, right? We had, that was our mantra at the church. God, you're good, and you're good all the time. All the time, you're good, God. God, you're good. And see, here's the thing. I don't know if anybody in the room here knows how this story ends. And those of you who didn't attend that church certainly don't know how the story ends. L let me ask you a question, though. They get to the hospital, they open the doors, and two dejected EMTs step out with their heads down. Is God good? Okay. Pull into the hospital, the doors are kicked open, and they're running the, the little girl through, and one of them gives a thumbs up to mom and dad. Is God good? all the time. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's happening in that ambulance that you can't see. God is good all the time. See, they didn't know how that story was going to end. You may not know how that story ends. You may know how this story ends, but you don't know how this story ends. And so in those moments when there's trouble, when there's doubt, when there's confusion, what I want you to know is that God is good all the time because all the time, God is good. God is good. So let's wrap up here um, tonight. We just three little things very quickly I want you to know from this passage. It'll be on the screen. Number one is this. We're not done with the story, but this is the first one. Number one, Jesus knows our situation. Go back and look at the story. Do a little Bible study when you get home. Look at everything Jesus knew before anybody else knew it. Do, do, you think, do you think for a moment it's like, oh, Lazarus is sick? Lazarus is not doing well? Oh my gosh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Jesus, is ne Jesus has never said, I don't know. Okay? I say I don't know a lot. Jesus has never said, I don't know. Jesus never said, whoops. Jesus has never said, let me get back to you. Jesus knows our situation. He knew what was happening in Bethany, even though he was across the river. Jesus knows what's going on in your mind, in your heart, in your family, at your work site, in your finances, in your health. Jesus knows Lazarus' situation. He knows Ellen's situation. He knows Emily's situation. He knows everything about our situation. That's good news because Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, Jesus is at work on our behalf, 
even when we don't know it or don't recognize it or don't see it. L- let, me, let me prove this to you. Jesus knows that he is sick. Jesus knows how it's going to go, and Jesus knows how it's going to end. And he says, let's go back over there. Oh, well, it's been two days, yeah, but let's go back over there. This is what I'm going to do. Now, Mary and Martha couldn't have known that. There's no text messages. This is slightly before email and social media, okay? So Jesus has to walk across the river back into God's land, right? And it's going to take some time, and some bad things are going to happen in that meanwhile. But what we can see here, even in these 16 verses, and certainly in the, the, the second and third part of this, is that Jesus is at work on our behalf even when we don't know it, don't recognize it, or can't see it. Okay, number three, and finally this. Jesus is willing to take great risks for us. So there was that line in here where Jesus goes, let's head back over there so I can be with Lazarus. And then one of the disciples says to him, you know, Lord, uh, Rabbi, the Jews there were just now seeking to stone you. They were going to kill you. And if you don't, just go back and look at John chapter 8, John chapter 9, John chapter 10. Jesus was, his life was being threatened at the capital in Jerusalem, in Judea, the southern part of the, the, the kingdom of God. And so Jesus has left, he's been teaching, he's been uh, instructing, he's been discipling his disciples, and now he gets word about Lazarus, and he begins to move back, after waiting two days, but he begins to move back, even though he's got to go to a place where his enemies want to kill him. Think about that. That, when you say, how do you know Jesus loved Lazarus? Because Jesus was willing to stick his neck out for Lazarus. But that, that's not the best proof I can give you. The best proof I can give you is actually the hands and the feet, the brow and the back of Jesus right now. You see, there's only a few man-made things in heaven. Primarily the scars and the wounds on Jesus' body. When I say that Jesus is willing to take great risks for those he loves, number one, let's identify who he loves. Everyone. Number two, great risks you have no idea what risks Jesus has traversed for you and me. He crawled upon a cross. He could have liberated himself from it. The Bible says he could have called out and with a spoken word commanded legions, thousands of angels to come and rescue him and smite, I mean, let's just go King James Version here, smite all those Roman soldiers and wicked, cruel, evil Jewish leaders. But no, he didn't. He allowed himself to be arrested. He allowed himself to be betrayed by a friend. He allowed himself to be beaten, to be mocked, to be scourged, to be ridiculed, to have his beard pulled, to have his body beaten, to have his flesh ripped from his frame. And then, if that wasn't enough, he allowed himself to be hung naked on a cross outside the city gates of Jerusalem, all the way to the point of death. I don't even know if great risk covers that. I think it's beyond great risk. This is a life draining mission. So I'm telling you, Jesus loves you. I've got nothing better for you tonight than Jesus loves you. Right where you sit, in your questioning, in your doubts, in your worries, in your anxieties, in your feeble efforts to understand, your your ensuing questions, Right now, right like you are, Jesus loves you. It's only going to get better. Now, as I close, let me say this. You might be thinking, well, Pastor Dave, I don't know how the story ends. Can I, can I read ahead? No, don't ever read your Bibles between Saturday nights. No, don't, don't ever do that. No, of course not. No, give me your Bibles. I'll, I'll pass them back out to you next Saturday night. No, of course Pick up in verse 17, read it. You'll glean something from it. And you can say, I've never, know, I don't know, actually, I don't, Pastor, I don't know this story. Then read this story. It's a great story. But let me tell you something. We're done tonight, and Lazarus is still dead. When you walk out of these doors next Saturday night, if the Lord doesn't return between now and then, and God knows he might, okay? All right? Um, when you leave next Saturday night, 
he's also still going to be dead. But our God, our Jesus, he gets the last word. And when he calls our names, what do we do? We go running out of those graves. Let's pray.